Okay, I think we're good to get started. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today at the Sick Coalition Summer Series. Um, we are on day, day three now. <laughs> um, so the Sick Coalition Summer Series is a week-long virtual event, um, which we are using to bring uh, community members together to learn from one another, discuss important issues, um, and engage in fun activities for all ages. Um, we have over 35 sessions planned for Sangat for this entire week, and we hope that you'll continue to join us um, for the rest of the week. Uh, we are so, 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 so excited to be welcoming Luck Breath Gore. Um, we are excited to be hosting this uh, talk called Building a Sangat of uh, Virtual Gars. A virtual song of Gars, uh, a chat with Gar Life director Luck Breath Gar. Um, Luck Breath Gar is the founder and editor in chief of Gar Life, a nonprofit online magazine striving to be the premier Sikh women's publication. Uh, established in 2014, Gar Life is infused with Gurmat and tailored for young Gars, and Gar Life hopes to be a space where Gars can express their ideas, share stories, and learn more about their Sikh culture to empower themselves. Um, Luck Breathe Gar is also a freelance writer, photographer, and has been published on NBC News, uh, Ms. Magazine, and Huffington Post, and other online journals. Uh, Luck Breathe Gar, in my world, is one of the most inspiring sick women that I know, and it is a true honor to be facilitating this conversation with her. Um, we're so excited to have you, Luck Breathe, um, and to really delve a little bit deeper into you know, more about you, your journey, um, and the, this virtual sangat that you have successfully been able to build. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and then for everyone who's here in the uh, Zoom and on Facebook Live, uh, if you have any questions for Luck Breathe during the session, you are able to ask in the Q&A function, which is on the bottom right of your screen if you're sitting in Zoom. If you're on Facebook Live and you have any questions, um, we will do our best to uh, check those out as well. But um, unfortunately, the priority will be going to questions on Zoom. So if you feel like you'll have questions, please join us here. You can register even right now um, at sickcoalition.org slash summer series and join us on Zoom. Um, all right, well, thank you. Uh, welcome, Luck Breathe. Thank you so much for having me. This is pretty awesome. and. To reciprocate, Harleen, you've also been one of my big inspirations. So this is a fun little hangout. Yes, <laughs> very fun public hangout. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I will stop sharing my screen here. Um, well, so to start, um, Luck Breathe, can you tell us a little bit just about why and how did you start Gar Life? Sure. So. Um, my, I have a sister. She is about eight or nine years younger than me. So when I was starting college, she was starting middle school. And I felt like there were so many things I wanted to talk to her about, like Sikhi, friends, family, career, Barna, Surup. And I felt like either she was too young or we just didn't have the language to communicate that. Um, and in addition to that, you know, I was going to all of these Sikh camps and young Gurmuth camps. And I felt like you know, we would have these core discussions. We'd have these emotional, heartfelt, um, empowering, you know, small group discussions. And then that would be it for six months. We, you know, we wouldn't be able to build on those conversations and we would be constantly rehashing some of the same topics over and over again. So I felt this, you know, creating a blog might be a way to document some of the things we were learning at camp so we could use them as a springboard to push our conversations forward but also as a way to serve as you know if and when my sister ever wanted to to see what I was thinking there would be a place for her to go and um you know learn from the, some of the experiences I had you know she and I were both at the time the only you know Punjabi sick women at our high schools. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of sick cores are feeling the same sort of isolation. And so this was a way for her to feel like she wasn't alone in the struggle. Um, so over time, I started adding other women's perspectives to the blog. The blog was called Core Thoughts. And I started realizing I that, <laughs> sorry, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, I was like 2010 ish. And um, I was realizing that people beyond my sister were reading it and other women from around the world were coming to it. So 
in 2014, I decided to make it a nonprofit online magazine called Core Life, where it wasn't just my thoughts. We, I started recruiting other contributors. At the very beginnings, I was just scouring Facebook, looking for any content that people had posted about sick women and messaging them saying, hey, can I post this? Um, and I started realizing that there was a need for this, that, that people were thirsty to hear from each other. And mm. the internet was an awesome medium to serve as a many to many platform, not just a one to many platform, like a book or a newspaper, for example. So yeah, that's how it started. That's really incredible to hear just, you know, the humble beginnings of something that I know now so many sick women hold so dear to them. Um, and, you know, now is a place that people very easily will turn. Um, you know, for advice or for really just anything about being a core nowadays. Um, so, Luckbreed, I actually wanted to sh screen share a little bit so other folks could see the website if they haven't seen it before. Sure, let's do that. Um, hold on. Sorry, folks. Navigating That's okay. Zoom. <laughs> so so just while you're pulling it up, I can kind of share yeah, a little please. bit about the website. So, um, Right now it's 100% user run, which means that I am no longer the primary writer and people can submit their content. We're mostly focusing on long form articles. And the way we choose our articles is it has to have at least something to do with a sick women's issue and combine Gurbani, Rehet, or Dwarik in the article. So it, you know, we want to have, make sure that our true north is Guru Sams, and so being a combination of Guru Granth and Guru Panth. And so that's why we have, you know, you can go on the website and see like the criteria we have when we publish something. So the hope is that through all of these contributions that we'll be able to start document our, documenting our own history. Um, you know, sick women are so often left out of the sick narrative, mm -hmm. the sick history. We have such bits and pieces of the sick women of our history that my hope is that maybe a hundred years from now we can look back and and not have that same problem that is so wonderful to hear i feel like i was having that conversation this morning with someone um where you know it, it's such a common experience i think for a lot of sick women to be told sakis or you know to be um in sick spaces and not feel like our history is not being told um or having trouble like seeing ourselves in sick history just because of the way that they're hearing it you know, mm -hmm. so I think that's such an amazing vision um, for us to have, you know, for in 100 years, people will know what we were doing now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, okay, I am ready to share my oh, let's screen. Do okay, sweet, let's um, do it. So I'd love to share with everyone what Gar Life looks like. Can you all see this? Luckily, can you see it? <laughs> I can, yes, I can see it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just scroll down. Um, I mean, okay. the articles are popping up in, in uh, order of of time and so you're going mm -hmm. to, through history um yeah and we've, we've kind of tried to categorize them as best as we can and right now what you're coming up to is we did a, a five-part series on black lives matter um and this was talking about why should we care why should sick women and specifically care you know what are the intersecting ideologies of white supremacy how does anti-blackness show up in the community mm -hmm. a lot of the conversations that many of us were having with in our own circles we, we kind we had you know, six different authors come together and collaborate and just kind of co collate everything we were hearing and seeing and infusing some Grabani, some feminist theory, some racial um, justice theory in there as well. So that was one of my favorite things to learn from this year. And then if you scroll to the top, you can see our virtual retreat, which is coming up in August, which has been something that has been pretty time consuming and really invigorating. Um, myself and then two of our board members, Harleen Gore and Isha Gore, have been working to develop this retreat for folks. And so hopefully if you, you haven't already signed up, we'll be able to share some of the recordings after this session. That sounds great. I know a lot of people are very, very interested um, in the Gore Life retreat and very thankful that you all are working so hard to create that space for us. Um, is there anything else you want me to flip through on the website? Just why not for fun, just go in historical photos. So um, one of my, yeah, one of my favorite things personally is to go through old historical photos and to find what 
what did our people look like back in the day? And I was able to find the earliest one was from like 1850 maybe of a young woman on her wedding day. And that got me really interested. So some of the photos you're seeing are actually contributions from some of our readers. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is one of my favorite things, like what did they wear? What did they look like? What was their relationship to their family? Um, there's some really funny ones from Jundigard School in the 1970s where it was from an all girls school and they were you know, dressed up in these goofy outfits, which is, it's fun to see people having fun because historical photos, everyone's like not smiling. So it was kind of cool to see that. So this is one of my favorite sections. This is amazing. I definitely recommend taking a look through all of this. It seems like if you click one, um, you get mm -hmm. to see even more. So yeah, there are about, each one of those is about 20-ish pictures with as much information as I could find. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm definitely going to take a look at this later. Um, okay, anything else you want to share on the website before we move on to some more questions? Um, there's a submit your work section on the right, and then uh, the resources tab is something. So one of the most surprising things I came across when run, starting this was so many people would come to Core Life asking for help, um, whether they were in a violent domestic situation or they were going through a lot of mental health struggles or you know, just wanting to have some type of support. And so I started compiling as many culturally sensitive resources as I could find. And so this mm -hmm. is a place that I'm constantly referencing for myself and to support other people who might be looking for support. So this is one of the other things that I, I like about Core Life. This is very, very helpful. I know um, for us with summer series just now, but all the time in our work, um, folks are often asking for resources. Um, so it's really good to know that this exists and, you know, resources that are culturally sensitive and competent. That's really, really important. I know folks are looking for that all the time. So mm -hmm. yeah. This. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing now so we can get to some more questions. Q&A is already starting to... Uh, pop so I want to make sure we get to everything um all right so why don't we actually just talk about um what is your typical day like you know I, I think mm -hmm. it's uh, really cool to know just to see like the finished product and to see um the kind of work that you've done but you know how does it all happen what is your what yeah is your sure um so it's so funny I think um a lot of our, our elders just think that I'm just messing around my computer all day, which is kind of true, but there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes. Um, for example, every day is like a ton of emails communicating with our writers, photographers, board members, partners, um, editing incoming articles, sourcing ideas and resources for future campaigns. Uh, I do all the graphic design for our social media and so managing Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then there's a lot of nonprofit management, like grant writing, banking, finances, taxes, government reporting, donor relations, um, and also standardizing and documenting all of the institutional knowledge that's been developed so far. So, you know, if I get hit by a bus, it can continue. Um, and then reading and learning, um, constantly making sure that I'm as well versed as I can be in some of these issues, because, you know, gender and religion is constantly evolving and changing. So I want to make sure that I'm not using out of date terms um, and constantly learning as much as I can. Um, and then typical day, of, like I mentioned before, it was mostly planning the retreat for the time being. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, I, it's funny that you bring up your parents like no idea what you're doing all day. But it's true, like running something like this, it takes all of your time. Um, but it's also amazing to see the fruits of that labor and, you know, to see um, how thoughtful everything that you're able to put out really is. Um, thank so you. thank you for all that you do. <laughs> of course, <laughs> to thank you. Get this final product. Yeah. Um, so in running uh, Core Life, what has been your biggest surprise? Um, yeah, so like I mentioned before, you know, the that, that a lot of people felt like they had nowhere else to turn when, when seeking domestic violence support. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a big one. And then a lot of hate mail. I am so surprised that, you know, every so often I'll open my inbox and there'll be some vitriol of you're too religious or you're not religious enough or why are you showing sick women with cut hair or you should only be showing women with cut hair. Like, first, you know, the, the entire spectrum, um, yeah. very diametrically opposed viewpoints, um, but written in, in such a way where it's, it's an attack 
and not an invitation to expand or, or converse. Um, and so at the beginning, that was, that was <laughs> my response to that was a lot of crying and like, what's the point of doing this? Why do I do this? Um, and my husband has been such an amazing support. Um, and so I, you know, with his, his coaching and his support, I've come to realize that this just means that people are, are, you know, called into um, conversation or they're made to think or it challenges their mm -hmm. paradigm a little bit. And so I always invite those people to, you know, why don't you write an article or share your perspectives? Because the last thing I want Core Life to be is a one-sided discussion. So that was, you know, the hate mail was, was hard and challenging and surprising um, and something I continually struggle with, but it's something that I think you know, you have to take the good with the bad when things happen. Um, I think when those personal attacks happen, my first response is to protect our writers because I don't really want our writers to feel like they're opening up their hearts just to be attacked or that they're doing something in vain. And so I always try to be the buffer as much as I can when those things happen. Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, I, I'm happy that you share that. I feel like that's a common conversation that lots of guards have, have all the time. Um, you know, being afraid to express who they really are, express their real thoughts um, on social media. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's very easy, I think, nowadays for folks to hide behind social media, hide behind their computers and, you know, just pass judgments um, on the way others choose to live their lives, you know. So I, I'm sure that it's actually helpful to hear, um, uh, you know, folks who are listening, I'm sure it's actually helpful to hear that you know, even folks like you go through that and have to, you know, they struggle a little bit with it, but um, yeah, you know, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's definitely, yeah, I'm sure a relatable experience for a lot. Um, you know, so on that, on that vein, what would you say is the biggest hurdle um, you have faced in running Gar Life? Um, you know, we talked about your biggest surprise, but yeah, um, you know, what do you struggle with the most? Um, at the beginning, it was like, will people read this? And I had mm -hmm. people close to me saying, oh, no one's going to read that. Or after five articles, you'll be, you'll be exhausted all of the topics. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that is a hurdle. But I think, you know, the also a really pleasant and awesome surprise has been that so many people have reached out with comments about how much core life has helped them and how meaningful it's been. And those are so heartwarming and uplifting. Um, you know, recently we did a reader survey to understand what people wanted and hearing mm -hmm. that core life has helped um, other women understand the diversity of sick women within the month or feel like they finally have a voice on topics that might be considered taboo um, and making people feel less insecure and alone. And we even had one saying, reach out saying, Core Life has helped him understand his wife and daughter more. And I was like, that's such a beautiful surprise that, you know, Sings are reading this too. So while the hardships and struggles are there, it's these little moments of joy and light that, that are giving me hope and momentum. That's really wonderful to hear. And I, I hope you don't mind, but I'm actually going to bring in a question from the Q&A that I feel mm -hmm. is relevant. Sure. Um, so someone is asking, what kind of pushback do you get from people for your focus on gender? Um, I think the biggest thing is sick. You know, some folks say sick is inherently equal. Why are you making this a big deal? Mm. And while that's true, while sex gender should not impact how we view Sikhi and it and it, spiritually it doesn't you know gurus are very clear that it doesn't matter what your social or physical situation is you have the ability to connect to the divine and you are a valuable human but the reality is um, our sex and gender impacts how we are perceived in our communities and it impacts the expectations our communities have of us based on what we look or what labels and boxes that our bodies lend ourselves to to be put into and so that that's one of the biggest pushbacks um mm -hmm. the other pushback i get a lot is um you know sikhi believes men and women are equal but we have different roles it's it's eerily similar to the separate but equal argument yeah. um mm -hmm. where gender people are seeing gender roles as something that shouldn't be challenged and shouldn't be questioned and in, in my opinion 
you know, gender roles if, are, are fine if that's something that you feel you're comfortable with and that you feel like you are celebrated as a human in that position. But once they become expectations and start limiting your ability to connect with the divine or reach your social goals or your personal goals, I think that's when it becomes problematic. So those are the, the two major pushbacks that I've experienced. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so, I mean, just in talking about, you know, the struggles that you face and the hurdles that you're facing um, with running core life, um, what is it that you would say actually keeps you going in the face of any kind of negativity that you're feeling? Um, so uh, reading those positive notes, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so funny, my therapist, positive she's like, here. in the Q&A, oh, very so nice sweet. positive things here too. <laughs> um, so my therapist said, you know, when you're feeling down, just pull up all of those mm -hmm. comments and just sit with them. And so I, sometimes I do that. Um, and then continually just looking back at the core life vision and mission that, you know, the readers and writers and to all of us together are helping create a society that the gurus encouraged and envisioned. And knowing there's a little look preet out there <laughs> and knowing that, like, you know, telling her that she's not alone in her struggles and mm -hmm. she can see herself in our history and being a sick woman can be beautiful and empowering. Um, so just keeping those in mind and, and reflecting on them and have a, being a physical reminder of my purpose, my big why is what encourages me to keep going. That's so wonderful to hear. And I really resonate with that. You know, there's a little luck breed somewhere out there. And I'm sure there are many, many, many little ones yeah. of all of us, um, you know, who definitely will have it a little bit better, I think. Um, I hope so. Of, yeah, because of your work and the work of so many amazing people who are contributing to Gore Life and just so many very inspiring callers that we have in our month right now. You know, there's so many people who are doing such good work. Um, and, you know, it's really just a blessing, I think, to be in their sangha uh, whenever we can. Yes. We live in an awesome time where we can connect with these wonderful Save Others and activists. Yes, definitely. And, and, you know, the virtual world is making it so much easier for us to create those connections, um, you know, especially for folks who don't live somewhere where there is much sangha that, you know, they feel like understands them. Um, it's really nice to be able to have this virtual platform to, you know, get that kind of support. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess I want to pivot a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. we definitely get back to these kinds of conversations. Um, but I'd love to talk a little bit about the writers that you work with. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what role uh, do you believe that the media has in storytelling? You were talking a little bit before about telling our own story, right? So I'd love to know mm -hmm. a little more about your experience with writers and um, that kind of storytelling that you're able to achieve uh, through our life. Um, uh, sure. Yeah. Sorry, the sun is setting. I'm gonna <laughs> one rest second. No worries. <laughs> okay, that's a little better. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. The media has has always had an interesting role in sh shaping people's self perceptions and our internalized narratives, and it also contributes a lot to developing empathy. I remember reading somewhere that it wasn't until the mass produced novel that people were able to empathize with um, people across the globe because they were able to emotionally connect with people. And I think, um, you know, the media can serve as a mirror and a megaphone, but also as a sculpture in how we perceive ourselves. So it's important that core life has a true north to keep us in check mm -hmm. and make sure we don't abuse that power, which is what I was saying before, Guru Granth, Guru Panth, Rehit Parik, and uh, Gurbani. Um, and having said that, I think having our true north and also remembering that sick is not necessarily sing. And a lot of our popular narrative, they become conflated, mm -hmm. where a lot of our activism starts centering around, well, our, our, the men folk look so exotic and we need to make sure that they're protected. And we often forget about the struggles and the challenges that sick women face. So, you know, Core Life Trip attempts to fill these gaps by providing resources and platforms in a support network. So ultimately, we can start having our own conversations about what it means to be sick women, um, what support do we need, and how do we want to shape the activism and advocacy um, within the sick spaces. Um, and so, yeah, I think the media is like any other tool. It's like a hammer can be used to build a house or to hit somebody. And at the end of the day, if core life can be 
something that helps you feel empowered to live your sick values. And I think we've had a good day. And, you know, when, if you're, I know a lot of folks these days are uh, curating their Instagram feeds. So if you're feeling some type of way that you'll just, you know, unfollow that person. And so we're hoping to have a very humanistic, realistic dialogue. So we do make that cut when you're calling your social media, because we don't want to make you feel bad. We want to empower you and support you and feel like you can take life by the horns and live your sick values in the way that you want to express them. Yeah, I mean, I actually want to um, pick up a little bit on one point that you made, um, you know, about how sick and sing has become conflated now, um, mm -hmm. or at least uh, recently. And I think that's a really good point that you bring up that, you know, while in the community, we have been very often centering the, the sing struggle, uh, you know, because of outward appearance or about, um, you know, the uniform. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that you brought up that, you know, guards face those struggles too, just in different ways, you know, um, mm -hmm. when, it, when it comes to bullying, um, bullying still happens to sick women, right? It just, it happens in a different ways. And it's important, I think, that we have those conversations and we get those specific resources that, you know, help sick women understand that one, what they're going through is valid. Um, and it, mm -hmm. it is happening, right? Um, and two, like, what can we actually do to deal with it? And I remember seeing that you had written um, a very comprehensive piece about, um, you know, bullying in the sick community. And I, I remember reading that and it was, it was really inspiring and honestly validating to see that written from a GAR lens, you know, um, oh, because very often, wonderful. yeah, very often that conversation, you know, um, just very naturally in our community does get focused um, mm -hmm. on, you know, on, young sick boys um and you know for good reason of course but also sure. you know there yeah. are there are other um parts to that conversation so mm -hmm. yeah i mean that article i definitely recommend uh for anyone who's interested in reading more um, from gar life i do recommend that one a lot um i'm glad it i'm glad it helped you that's awesome yeah of course um okay so another question um how has the gar life community shaped your own definition of womanhood yeah, oh, that's such an interesting one. Um, I think growing up, uh, my idea of what it meant to be a woman, and for many of our readers, it's, it's shaped by the U.S. or Western forces and Indian culture. And so that could be like performing for the male gaze, performing femininity, gender roles, body image. And there hasn't been at least for in, in my experience, spaces where we can understand what it means to be a sick woman. And for me, what that means is, you know, following the Guru's path to connect with the divine and exploring that in the face of things like misogyny, sexism, gender roles, uh, external perceptions, family expectations of what a female should be. So standing up for, against those elements with Guru's word and with our history, for me is what being a sick woman means and to learning that you know you can be comfortable when forces around you tell you you're not you're wrong or that you don't belong and it's a lifelong journey to establish your sovereignty so you know reading about other sick women's experiences through core life um i've come to understand that womanhood is such a fluid dynamic and shifting term that may or may not accurately represent what our community is experiencing and knowing that it's okay for me to feel like I don't really know what the definition is and that maybe it'll change from one day to the next, but knowing that as long as I'm striving to live my values and to connect with the divine, you know, it doesn't matter what labels there are. Um, and so I think, yeah, the sick community and the diversity of cores and the different ideas I've been exposed to through core life has helped me understand that, it's, it's constantly in flux and that's okay. It's okay to sit with the comfort and that's taken me several years to, to come to terms with. I, th I think that's a really, really beautiful answer. And I really like what you said about how, you know, getting to read other people's perspectives has really helped inform, um, you know, what your idea of womanhood is. And I, th I think that, you know, that's such an important way for all of us to be thinking, um, you know, for us to take other points of view into account, you know, to learn about others, but also to learn more about ourselves. So I think that was very poignant. Um, I, I was yeah. going to add that 
in Gurbani, the gurus have often adopted perspectives of different sexes and genders to write about mm -hmm. their experiences and to write about their emotions. And that's really helped me uh, and think about how can empathy help me understanding the plight of six who don't necessarily d identify with the labels of womanhood. Um, what does it mean to be a man, woman, both or neither? You know, do these boxes bring us pain or comfort? Mm -hmm. And, you know, recently an article written by Arun, Arun Nima explored this idea of what is the role of, of gender in Sikhi and is it something we should challenge? Is it something we should embrace? So I think the idea of what is, how does my relationship to womanhood change through core life is, is mostly about just asking questions and constantly asking why, why are things like this? Um, yeah. Why are there boundaries? Who does it serve? What feels good to me? I love that. And I mean, isn't that what being a Sikh is about, right? It's about constant mm -hmm. learning, about asking questions um, and challenging the norms that we've been taught to just live life with. So, I mean, I, th I think that's amazing. Um, so, I mean, if you don't mind, let's talk a little yeah. bit um, about your future. So, I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I want to make sure we get through our questions before we get to all the amazing questions in the Q&A. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what does in your mind right now, what does your career path look like or your journey yeah. as a writer? And I mean, feel free to touch a little bit on the past and the future. Um, we just love to know more about that career path. It's definitely a path that I think folks might be interested in, but may not know much about. Okay, sure. Um, so while I was going through university and grad school, it felt zigzaggy, but in retrospect, I feel like there were always a through line of writing and breaking down complex or challenging ideas into easily digestible pieces. So um, in undergrad, I majored in political science and mostly because I wanted to get a greater understanding of Punjab struggle from an international context and what did our self-sovereignty and human rights push look like from an international perspective? How are other communities addressing their similar struggles for self-determination? Um, and through that, I, I learned a lot about the Green Revolution and the devastation it caused to our people. So mm -hmm. I took a break from school and I did AmeriCorps for a year, which is similar to Peace Corps, but in the United States where you serve um, local communities. And then my interest in Green Revolution and water rights continued and it was still pretty strong. So I did a master's in environmental policy and some post-grad work during, uh, during international relations. And during that process, I ultimately just found myself just spending more and more time writing on the Core Thoughts blog. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that my heart has always been in sick issues and serving the sick months. So I was going to shift my energies to doing that full time. Um, and all of you know, the, the writing heavy courses that I took helped, you know, make come that into fruition. So when it comes to the future, I, it's definitely like, hoping core life becomes more robust, more self-sustaining. Um, we're actually working on a new website right now, so it'll have a beautiful makeover hopefully soon. Um, it's already so beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, to continue to, to make core life more robust, maybe if the retreat goes well, which I'm hoping it, and it will, um, you know, exploring that in the future, can we make retreats part of our platform? Um, and then I've also started doing some freelance photography and there's some wonderful photographers out there who've been starting to document sick life in the most beautiful artistic ways. And I would love to contribute to that as well. So that's what my future looks like. Yeah, um, Lockbraith also has a photography Instagram. If you all are interested, <laughs> it's at Lockbraith Photo, correct? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so make sure you're supporting Lockbraith in that lens too. Um, so actually, while um, you're bringing up the topic of the Gore Life retreat and, you know, what you think um, the future of Gore Life would look like, there's actually a really good question in the Q&A. Um, so for Gaurs that are feeling disconnected, um, how would you recommend that they connect to Sangat and to Sikhi and to other Gaurs? Mm -hmm. and in the same vein, there's another question also asking about and what are your recommendations for building virtual Sangat? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so... That's a great question. Um, and I can only answer from what I've personally experienced and helped me. And I think the answer will be specific and unique to each person. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, it was just reading and surrounding myself with books. So, and, and right now you can online articles. So if I couldn't physically be around six, at least I could surround my book sangit 
of six and six ideas and six experiences. Um, the other idea is if you have a couple of sick friends and you don't live near them, you can always do Zoom kirtans, Zoom gurbani vichars, um, Zoom uh, like together if that's something that you're interested in. Um, camps is also a great one. And in, for me, Instagram and social media has been my favorite platform. I've I've developed friendships through that of people I've never met before, but our mm -hmm. values just click. So, mm -hmm. you know, DMing them, reaching out, saying, hey, I'd love to chat more with you, hopping on mm -hmm. calls. Um, and then, Instagram you know, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Instagram's on good. <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah, good. It is a real thing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if you go on Core Life's resource page, we've I've started listing a lot of different camps and retreats. And uh, many of those now in the COVID era have moved to digital platforms. So it doesn't matter where you live, you can still access a lot of those resources. Um, what else would I suggest? Yeah, those are the big ones. I think the digital stuff is just a pretty awesome new tool that we have at our disposal. For sure. And then, I mean, in the same vein, do you have any suggestions for folks who are looking to create more in-person summits, you know, maybe creating six spaces that aren't virtual? Oh, yeah. Um, so one thing that we started to explore pre-lockdown was just getting, you know, there's only a couple of sick families where we live. So just getting together and doing potlucks and doing cute then you know you're just hanging out even if you're not doing a quote unquote six specific activity um if one of us goes to volunteer somewhere we'll invite everyone over we'll do a big seva project together um another mm -hmm. idea is think about how you can leverage your gordwada to serve you that's been um, a topic recently that a lot of young people are exploring is you know the gurdwara and guru nanak's vision of the tharamsal was about to be a place of learning and to be a place to serve mm -hmm. in Sangit. So how can we make sure it's not just a place where we go on Sundays and eat our longer and go, but a place mm -hmm. that can actually serve as a meeting space, whether it's, you know, hanging out before a protest or having discussions that might be considered taboo or having a safe mm -hmm. space where people can feel like they can come together and, and feel empowered. I, I really like that you brought up the idea of a safe space. And I wonder if you could actually just for a minute, like talk, on what your recommendations are for creating a safe space because I feel like we say that word a lot yeah. you know um I think there's also something to be said for you know experience in creating that space or facilitation skills mm -hmm. do you have any just quick recommendations on how you can ensure that a safe space that you're creating is really a safe space yeah I think um the first thing would be to figure out what topic you're going to be discussing mm -hmm. in this space and then you know looking at which organizations have I touched on this before. For example, if you're looking to create a safe space to address issues of domestic violence, like Manavi is a great South Asian specific resource and they mm -hmm. have outlined what does it mean to be a safe space? How do you deal with confidentiality? How do you deal with um, survivor centered approaches to safety and, and family perceptions and community perceptions? What does language look like? Um, are euphemisms appropriate? to protect people or are they dangerous mm -hmm. in terms of preventing actual conversations? So understanding your topic and your audience can help establish the, the tone and then communicating your intentions with everybody in the space. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a professional in this space, which is why I'm always about, you know, look at folks who have done this before who have scientifically backed evidence or anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence on what works and what doesn't work. Um, and yeah, having confidentiality, um, establishing ground rules about, you know, I centered statements versus accusatory statements. Some of the stuff that all of us um, might have tuned out during our, <laughs> our college dorm experiences, but, you know, actually do have a place in creating safe spaces. Yeah, definitely. That, that's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, I mean, we're getting a lot of questions, actually, I think from folks who are interested in doing this kind of work as well, you know, in, in writing and in storytelling. Oh, sweet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think just one overarching question that would help a lot of folks who are listening is, you know, what is your advice for someone who's looking to start writing? Um, you know, maybe some technical advice on, you know, what do you do um, when you have a vision and you want to get it down on paper? Um, yeah. But also, you know, in the first place, how do you even get the courage to, you know, write something and share it in public? Sure. Yeah. So the cool thing about the internet is you can be anonymous, which can lead to dangerous things like trolls. But if you don't have the courage to to speak your mind 
with your own name to it, that's something that you can use to your advantage. Um, so if you, for example, want to like start a blog, it's pretty easy. There's so many websites like Squarespace and WordPress, um, Wix, I think. And mm. some of these are free services. You can just start writing. And the nice thing is it doesn't need to be polished. It can just be a way for you to start crystallizing your ideas for yourself. Um, so my idea, my suggestions would be come up with a plan, very clear about, you know, your topic, your intention, your benchmarks, your goals, but also be flexible. And then ask and interview as many people as you can who are in that space or who are doing what you want to do. And be really clear about what your questions are and what you want to gain from talking to those people. And then develop the skills that you need to execute those, you know, taking that, those people's advice and, and putting it into practice. Um, also, it doesn't matter if you have a lot of followers at the beginning. Everyone mm -hmm. starts with zero. And if you see someone with a million followers in three days, that those are probably bots. Um, so don't, don't put credence in that. And also, you, your value as a writer and your value as thoughts and ideas don't really come from followers. I mean, if someone, if one or two people find what you're saying is valuable, then I think that that's successful in itself. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really helpful advice for a lot of folks who are watching right now. Um, and I mean, I really like that you brought up the amount of followers, right? Because I think that's a very common, um, it's just a very common concern and worry that a lot of people have um, yeah. when starting to share their work. Um, and, you know, in any creative space, not just in writing. Um, you know, earlier today, we had, an, we had a talk back with Inquisitive and even mm -hmm. he was sharing um, that he doubts himself. Right. And yeah. that's such that's such a common thing for so many creatives, no matter how successful you are. Right. That's that's just something that is always a little bit in the back of your mind. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I wonder what advice you have um, for folks yeah. to put themselves out there. And, you know, of course, the anonymity is definitely mm -hmm. a good tool. Right. But even just to get over that, right? What What is your advice to, for folks to put themselves out there? But then also, um, you know, how can they deal with those doubts that they might have yeah. with their own work? Sure. Um, so I think Punjabi culture is very much, and maybe even American to this extent, is um, very much externally driven, where a lot of our self-worth and value comes from external mm. expectations and praise and benchmarks. So we're allowing other people to define what success looks like for ourselves. So if you um, have a very clear purpose of, okay, I'm going to share my art because it brings me joy and I want it to bring someone else joy, then it doesn't matter how many followers you have. It mm -hmm. just means that, hey, some people are, you know, enjoying your art. If your intentions are to get famous, then, then you know, the anxieties of what that brings with it is going to be completely different than a different motivation. So being clear about your motivation and your intentions mm -hmm. can be, can be helpful. Um, and so one thing I've heard is, you know, you have your cloud motivations and you have your sunshine and the cloud is, uh, I got to get more followers. I have so much anxiety. If I stop doing this and people think I'm a failure, if I don't get enough followers and if someone thinks that my art is dumb or stupid, then I'm going to feel like crap. So that's the cloud motivations, right? You have all these negative things motivating you to continue to work, do your work because you're afraid of falling behind. Then you have your sunshine motivations, which are, you know, I'm doing this because, you know, I feel like this is a calling within me and it brings me joy. Or um, I truly believe in the Guru's values and I want to make sure that I'm part of this, something larger than myself. Um, you know, I just enjoy writing and I want to put it out there because it's just a nice way for me to organize my thoughts. So those are the sunshine things, the positive motivations that pull you forward. And, you know, you will, at least I go back and forth from both of them from time to time. And so being very mindful of, of what drives me and what's going to be sustainable is something that I find to be really helpful. Um, and have at least one cheerleader, find one person who who you know always say something positive to you it doesn't matter if like your human figure actually looks like a monkey but they'll still tell you it looks great it, having that one person as a cheerleader is something that's really valuable that, that's great um and then in, i think before we move on to like a different vein of questions um you know i, I think in a creative field um a lot of folks they find you know um, their own inhibitions or their own um, worries in putting themselves out there. But I mean, I do know that there, there are definitely a lot of 
young sick women who are interested in creative careers um, and may not be finding that support um, you know, from their community or from um, their family, you know, so do you have any advice for young girls who might be, you know, interested in pursuing a non-traditional career path um, and, you know, need that, that little bit of push, yeah. um, you know, to do it? Sure. So um, one thing is on Core Life, there's a whole series called Core Careers where we address that question where different, we interview a bunch of different women in creative spaces from filmmaking to art, uh, like Rupi Kortut is on there. Mm -hmm. um, filmmaking like uh, Manmeet Kaur is on there. Um, and uh, just a bunch of different women. Oh, we have a woman who worked for Burberry, a woman who worked for Disney. So different people have shared their mm -hmm. advice on exactly this. And it, I think it really depends on your family. Like, you, you know, what kind of words resonate with them? What mm -hmm. are they afraid of that will happen when you pursue this career? Are they afraid that you're not going to make money? Are they afraid you're not going to find a suitable partner? Um, are they afraid you're going to be living in their basement the whole time? And then try to address those points being like, hey, I understand these are valid concerns for you. You just want my well-being at heart. But let's talk about each of these and how, you know, does being an artist actually not as scary as you think it is. Sometimes they just haven't seen it being done, so they don't know it can be done. Um, maybe recruiting an older Banji or a Didi who's, you know, trailblazed mm -hmm. something and have them talk to your folks about, you know, it's not as scary as you think it is. I'll be here to support her. Um, here's a backup plan, you know, to placate mm -hmm. them. Um, if it doesn't work out, here's something that can happen. Um, and <laughs> I used to do PowerPoint presentations to try to convince my parents of silly ideas. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's you know, well researched. <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes if you preemptively think about some of the the challenges or qualms that they'll come mm -hmm. up with, you can address them before they even come up. Um, and then showing your dedication and your commitment that this isn't just a phase will also help a lot. And ultimately, um, there is a little bit of practicality and realism. Like if, for example, if you're coming from a socially disadvantaged background or, mm -hmm. you know, family is, uh, money is tight for your family, then maybe you, you do need to think about, you know, what, what can I do to socially and economically create a stable household? And then maybe mm -hmm. I can do this as a side hustle on the side, you know, pursue my art as something on the side. So um, as much as we all say, follow your passion, sometimes that's just not a realistic and practical mm -hmm. path for some people. And then also on the flip side, if you want to be a doctor and engineer, that's awesome too. Like, don't let people tell you just because you want to be a doctor that that's not good enough because it's not creative. Because if that's what you like doing, then why would you give that up? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for answering all these questions that are very career specific. Um, it's really inspiring, I think, to see that there are so many folks in the chat and in the Q&A right now um, who are interested in these kind, this kind of work. Um, and I'm actually seeing some comments of folks saying that um, you've inspired them to start their Aww. own blog or to write themselves. Um, That's yeah, so cool. You know, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> um, and I'm seeing some compliments. Uh, Core Life has a really easy to use search button, makes uh, yes. it really easy to find articles on any topic. So nice work on that. Nice. Um, yeah, you know, lots of lots of love here in the Q&A. Um, someone oh, actually thanks asked- Thanks everyone. Hmm? I just <laughs> said thanks everyone. Yeah, um, and someone even actually asked here, um, is there a place on the Core Life website where you can ask questions? Um, so the search function is great, but yeah, is there a place <laughs> where folks can solicit advice directly on the website? So we used to have um, an advice column and it was getting very, very heavy, right? Awesome questions. Um, our writers needed to take a break from that. So um, while that's pending, you can always send us questions um, at hello at corelife.org. And we always try to make sure, it might take a couple of weeks to get back, but we will always try to make sure to respond to your questions. Um, and if we can't give you an answer, we'll refer to you, uh, you to somebody else. So while the advice column is taking a break, that's, that's the way you can do that. Great. Um, so there are a couple other topics I want to touch on, but I'm seeing we only have eight minutes left. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a couple of rapid fire questions that seem like they're pretty okay. easy, and then <laughs> we'll uh, move on. So um, All right. Folks are asking about the Garlic Retreat. Um, yes. So is there still a way for folks to register? Is there a wait list? Can you tell us more about that? 
Yes, so um, the waitlist officially closed on July 13th. If you would still like to be considered for a spot, you can email us at hello at corelife.org. We have a couple of folks that, depending on our capacity mm -hmm. and our technical limitations, we can consider other people, although I can't guarantee anything at the moment. Okay, good to know. Um, oh, here's a good one. Um, how would you say Agor Life has changed or evolved over time? Yeah, so um, just very aesthetically, it was a lot of chevron in the beginning, just, you know, that zigzaggy pattern that everything yeah. goes on everywhere. Um, aesthetically is that um, at the beginning, it was a lot more art focused and it shifted a lot more to um, thought pieces. So that's kind of just how generally the content is shifted, mostly because um, that's what our readers really appreciated hearing from a lot more. And there are a lot of art platforms out there. So we didn't want to really, we didn't want to be redundant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Good to know. And I mean, if you missed the beginning part um, of the conversation, Luckbury did talk all about the journey of Gore Life um, from Gore Thoughts to Gore Life. So, I mean, you can definitely check out the recording afterwards. Um, okay, so it seems like we have some more questions about uh, community organizing. So maybe if you want to answer this one really quickly, um, what advice do you have for initiatives um, like Sick Teens, uh, mm -hmm. who are also working to give voices to young sick youth? So I think that's a lot of the work that you do is like giving voices to the youth. So what advice do you have for other folks? Yeah, uh, Sick Teen is awesome. I'm so happy. It was like so awesome to see what they're doing. Um, advice would be recruit as many people as you can. So it's not just a one person endeavor because you'll burn out quickly. Mm -hmm. um, interview other folks who are doing what you want to and, and find out because I could like anybody who wants to can message us and I can share some of our social media tips on how we've gotten followers um, and experiment with stuff and if it doesn't go well you can just delete it <laughs> um, there are a lot of tools online like Canva and um, Unfold which can help make your aesthetics a little bit more interactive and pleasing um, yeah and always have a learner mindset instead of a knower mindset. So instead of preaching, being like, this is how it should be being, maybe change that orientation to this is how it could be. And what do you think? Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, okay, so because we have six minutes, I wanna get to yeah. the other questions um, <laughs> that may not be as easy to answer. Um, and oh, I know no. this is a whole can of worms, <laughs> but um, so what would you say is the role of sick men uh, supporting GARS, um, you know, and to better understand support guards to better understand the challenges and aspects of life that we face. So I guess what yes. would you say is just the role of sick men in challenging patriarchy? Yeah, so so patriarchy is, is a system that values masculinity over femininity. And those two terms are, you know, defined within culture and time. And patriarchy can perpetuate oppressive and limiting gender roles, the gender binary, transphobia, sex, um, and sexual assault. So it doesn't just hurt people who are women identifying, but it can hurt everybody. For example, um, you know, if men aren't encouraged to cry, and if you like flowers as a man, that may be considered problematic. Or if you choose to be a stay-at-home dad, that might not be considered as cool or as macho. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, dismantling the patriarchy is something that's super hard. Um, and sometimes it can be harder for men because it, it's it's not as talked about as much as it is for women. You know, smash the patriarchy has become a term that a lot of women have taken up in recent years. Um, but, you know, the byproducts of a society that values women over men can cause everybody to start doubting themselves, undervaluing themselves, and, sh and, and start internalizing shame if they don't fit into these certain categories. Um, so I think that's one thing that men can do is just to, con and, and uh, frankly, anybody is like continually question, like, why? Like, why is it that um, I can sit however I want to, but a woman has to keep her legs closed? Why is it that, you know, men, you know, aren't supposed to cry? Or why is gender fluidity discriminated against or non-binary people hidden? And, you know, for things like if you see someone calling out a girl for her facial hair, you can also step up and say, hey, that's not cool. Um, or if you, you know, if a grunty says, sorry, your daughter can't do Joriseva because she's on her period, you know, you can stand up and say, actually, that's not really Gurmuth. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because 
currently in our culture, a lot, of, most of the time, men have a little bit more power and access that they can leverage that to help other folks who don't necessarily have that same sort of privilege. Um, and then, you know, supporting women if, you know, if, for example, my husband always asks, hey, do you need help in the kitchen? And that's like such a simple question that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, boys aren't raised to even think or ask, and yet it, it means a lot. So just constantly looking like, or even just talking to people, the cores in your life, like, what can I do specifically to support you? Like, you know, if you're going to wear shorts, I'm going to support you. And if people start <laughs> calling you names, I'm going to be there to make sure that they don't. Um, or shutting down jokes that are made in your guy circle that are transphobic or homophobic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Thank you for touching on so many important ways that, you know, things can support the guards in their life. Um, and I think just talking about patriarchy and misogyny, um, I think another part of that is also, you know, patriarchy can be perpetuated by folks that are not men as well, right? Um, so another great question here um, is, you know, what can we do um, to be more ex inclusive of all guards in six yeah. years, you know? So folks who may be practicing, um, like have different connections with Ziki, right? We all have our own journey, we all have our own connection. Um, yeah. and we have our own ways of, you know, practicing that connection outwardly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so what can we do, I guess, to be more inclusive? Yeah. Uh, in those spaces, yeah. And that's um, um, all genders. Yeah. I think we are very quick to, to cancel and judge other folks who don't, mm -hmm. you know, follow Sakeen the way we believe it should be followed. And we're creating up these these walls that really prevent us from connecting and prevent us from seeing the divine in each other. And we don't know what those person's struggles are. So how can we judge them for what they're going through? And, and we're really not supposed to be judging people. It's a human, human nature and that's, but the beauty of being human is, is that we are aware of, of some of our shortcomings and we can work mm -hmm. to dismantle some of those. Um, so I think just inviting people into spaces. Um, I know I interviewed a bunch of sick women with the stars and they always felt like, people thought they, people thought they thought they were better than everyone else. And that was super hurtful to them because mm -hmm. they just wanted to express their connection to Guru Saab in their way, but they also wanted to be included. So I think this first step is just to invite people into your circle, um, to include them. And, and if you're, in, if you're in a circle where there's gossip going on to, to call those people in the conversation and say, Hey, like, you know, you, these people, are just as equal as, as we are spiritually. And just because they're out really dressing or practicing in a different way doesn't mean that they aren't valuable as well. And as simple as those two things sound, like shutting down gossip and inviting people into your circle, those are, are very challenging things to do. Yeah, um, no, thank you for that. Um, and you know, I really wish we had more time because there's so many great questions in the Q&A right now. Um, I think before we sign off, um, you know, and I feel so bad cutting this conversation short because it's so important, um, but there are a lot of people asking just, you know, how can they get involved? Um, how can they yeah, help they totally. themselves, you know, and, and on that note, do you have any advice for folks that, you know, want to write um, and they just don't know how to start, you know, is there yes. support for writers as well? Yes, so first we're always looking for writers. If you have ideas and you, you are at a loss as to what to do, um, we can always send you a guide, a step-by-step -step guide on how to organize your thoughts. Um, there are also other ways we can work together to create articles if you don't feel like you're a strong writer. So um, through like audio and video interviews, we can craft something creative. Um, so reach out at hello at corelife.org uh, or you can go onto our submissions tab on the website and it talks about the different ways you can write for Core Life. Um, Follow us on social media, uh, engage with questions when we share like questions on our stories. And the last way you can get involved is to donate. Currently Core Life is completely um, donor run and grant driven. So we don't do any sort of advertising. That's actually really amazing. Um, you know, people have asked, been asking questions about scaling as well. Um, so mm -hmm, that's yeah. really important to hear. Um, so definitely folks, um, that, that last part, you know, that's one way that I think folks don't think always about support. Um, you know, there's there's the support you can do uh, through your work. There's also, um, you know, support through resources. So definitely do consider that. 
Um, and for anyone who's looking for information on how they can get in contact with uh, Gore Life and with Luck Breathe and how they can submit their work, uh, that information is in the chat right now. Um, so make sure you're checking that out. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sorry to have to end the conversation now. Uh, there's so many good questions here in the chat. Um, and, you know, we've put Luck Breed's email here, uh, hello at gorelife.org. So if you do have more questions for her, I really do recommend um, reaching out to her directly. She is an amazing mentor um, and oh. really so eloquent when it comes to giving advice. Um, I feel like that's all I've been asking you for this entire conversation is what advice do you have here? What, what about there? <laughs> um, I hope yeah, it's helpful. Absolutely. And I, I think it's, you know, really important for young guards, you know, the little luck breeds out there um, to be able to feel like they have somewhere to go just to get that advice. Um, you know, so I, I can't compliment Gar Life enough and the platform that you've built. Um, and we're so thankful that we were able to have this conversation with you today. Um, so thank you. Thank you for everything. Yeah. And thank you. And thanks to Coalition for all of your support. And, and I, again, want to say it wasn't just me as all of our writers and contributors and readers. So um, thanks everyone for this awesome opportunity. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, with that, I think we're ready to close. Um, and again, if you do have more questions for Luck Breathe um, or even just want to send her some love, please do so um, at hello at Luck Breathe. Sorry, hello at gorelife.org. <laughs> um, and um, connect with them on social media. Uh, and summer series, we are very excited to be ending day three. Um, please do keep joining us throughout the week. Um, you know, this conversation is about sick women. We're highlighting so many more amazing sick women um, you know, through the rest of the week, um, many who have even been mentioned in this talk. So you know, we really hope that you'll continue to join us. Uh, for the rest of the week um, until Saturday. So thank you all again for joining us um, and have a good night. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.